If you've been following this YouTube channel for the last few months, you will know that I've been setting up a museum uh, of experimental and obsolete technologies. And it's been quite a lot of work to say the least. However, we are on the home stretch. And a couple of months ago, I started working on electronics regarding relays. And I started by making a synthesizer sequencer made completely from relays. The next video in the relay series is coming up as I have already made some circuit boards that will come together to make a much more elaborate sequencer. It's pretty much a musical relay computer. The thing that attracted me to this certain element of electronic technology was, well, the physical mechanical nature of it. The fact that you could tangibly see and hear electronic decisions uh, being made. As I was getting into this stuff and transferring discrete uh, circuitry into sort of relay circuitry, well, a BT technician by the name of Chris uh, got in touch. After mentioning this relay project to Chris, naturally, the conversation veered to uh, telephone exchanges. Chris chatted about how telephone exchanges have changed and how electromechanical mechanical they once were. Well needless to say it sent me down quite a bit of a rabbit hole. Naturally this sent me on the hunt for different pieces of technology. Right in front of us is a 4000 type group selector that I got for about £40 off of eBay. This did not include the switch cradle at the bottom uh, which I only got a couple of days ago and this was a whole world of pain for getting hold of. <laughs> and a few weeks ago after I repaired the ratchet mechanism I did a video on it kind of getting it up and running. <laughs> Obviously at that point I didn't have the switch contacts, so there wasn't really that much I could do with this. Naturally, after getting hold of this step-by-step -step group selector, well the next step was getting hold of a few more so I could make a functioning installation at the museum. But alas, it was proving a lot harder than I was initially expecting. With this one, I'm gonna be making a 10x10 10 10, uh, coordinate selector, so you can actually draw a 10x10 10 10 pixel screen by typing in the coordinates. It's gonna take this and another little bit of circuitry to actually be able to modify this to act more like a final selector, which is possible. After posting the first video of figuring out what the fudge this thing was, well, I was quite overwhelmed by the amount of people that got in touch afterwards, including the owner of the Hayes Valley Telephone Museum, who own a vast array of different types of exchanges and switches and telephones. I'm gonna be going and checking that out. Along with this, I was pleasantly surprised that quite a few retired telecom engineers got in contact. And it proved very apparent that a lot of engineers have very fond memories of when step-by-step -step exchanges were in operation. So a lot of my time is spent researching and looking into various old tech for these kind of videos and getting hold of things to do videos on. And I managed to stumble across an online seller who was selling a couple of small pieces of telephone exchange equipment. At the bottom of one of these listings in the description it said we'll be listing more telephone exchange equipment in the coming weeks so I thought oh maybe I should maybe I should get in touch this seller called Richard turns out to be a retired British telecom engineer he mentioned that he got the pleasure from sourcing and servicing the parts and building them into functioning racks in his spare room and the fact he was going to break it down to parts and sell it on eBay I explained my rather optimistic plan of sourcing all the parts and being able to put it together myself and rightfully so he mentioned that yeah I was probably being rather rather optimistic because whilst I may have been able to relatively simply string together a couple of group selectors and a final selector well everything else that is around it well that's a whole other kettle of fish entirely so what he suggested next was oh yeah it was it was perfect he suggested that out of his setup he would rearrange a whole rack to be basically a functioning installation he would rather most of it going all in one piece as a functioning piece instead of sadly being parted out for pieces on eBay funnily enough this very same week I sold a couple of old Eurorack modules that I didn't use anymore and and yeah, the kind of price came up to a very similar point. So I, I was, yeah, I was, I was over the moon. And this is the rack in question right here. This thing is truly incredible. Richard even offered to drop it off to make sure it would work on this side. And yeah, it's just, it's just so cool. But before we have a closer look, it doesn't seem right for me to introduce this. So here is Richard. I'd like to show you this model of an old telephone exchange. This type of exchange was invented by a man called Elman B. Strauger who lived in Kansas in the 1880s. At that time, telephones were pretty few and far between. And if you wanted to make a call to, say, Mr. Jones, the butcher, then you just pick up the receiver, you'd be connected to the operator, and she would say, number please. And if you didn't know Mr. Jones's number, it didn't really matter because it was only a small town and she probably could put you through anyway. So that was sorted. Unfortunately for Mr. Strouger, he was an undertaker and in that town at the time, there were two undertakers. The operator happened to be married to the other one. So every time somebody rang up asking for the undertaker, she put the call through to her husband. Poor old Mr. Strouger was losing money. So he had to do some quick thinking 
And what he managed to come up with was a system of switches, one which fixed at the telephone end that the caller could tap and send pulses down the line, and another one in the exchange that would operate to these pulses and connect the line through to Mr Jones the butcher. So didn't need the operator anymore, so job done. Over the years, Strouge also managed to invent the telephone dial, so that made life even easier. And gradually, this system became the standard automatic telephone system. In the early 1900s, when the British Post Office were beginning to consider converting our exchanges to automatic, it was the Strouge's system that they went for. 1912 saw the first automatic exchange and the first telephones with dials and this system was used by the post office up till the late 70s. These switches date from the mid 60s and were a type that was typically installed in a small country exchange. They don't really look anything like Strouger's originals because it was considerably modernised and improved over the years. But the principle is the same. The principle of sending a call through the exchange was also called a step-by-step -step system because it goes through one step at a time. So if we want to make a call from this phone on the left to the one on the other side, we need to dial its number, which is 57862. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick up the handset, which connects us through to the first selector and the first selector sends us back dial tone. That's the equivalent of the operator saying, number please, so we're ready to go. So the first number is a five. When I dialed a five, hopefully you can see this switch step up to the fifth level, and then it's gonna look across the contacts on that level to look for a free second selector, which is gonna be this one. So here we go. Well, we seize the second selector. Now this is waiting for the next number, which is a seven. Now we're through to the third selector, eight. And now we're through to the final selector. Now the final selector doesn't need to look for the next selector because there isn't one, this is the final. So we're gonna step up to level six and then it sits there and waits. The final digit, which is a two, is going to step it to the second contact. That's the contact that this phone is wired to. When it steps to that contact, before it can start ringing, it's got to test the line because that line could be busy, in which case it needs to send back busy tone to tell the caller they're talking on the phone, so you need to hang up and try again. Or it could be a spare line, in which case it needs to tell the caller by sending number unobtainable tone, which means that you've got the wrong number, so hang up and check it. And if it's free, then it's going to send back ringtone to tell the caller that the line is being rung and it needs to send forward ringing current to ring the bell. So let's do the final two. There we go. It all happens a bit quick. When the call's answered, then the final selector needs to connect the two together so that we can speak. Hello? Yeah, hello, how are you? Also, the most important thing is the final selector needs to send a pulse back to the meter so that I get paid. And then at the end of the call, we're going to hang up and you see all the switches release, ready to take another call. It takes all this just to do one call. In a modern exchange, equipment that was using this amount of space could probably pass hundreds of calls at the same time. That's not so interesting to look at as this is. So why don't you give it a go for yourself? So this specific setup isn't exactly how it would have been set up in a telephone exchange. This is just enough to basically make a phone call between two phones uh, with separate five digit numbers. For instance, on this side, it's 57862 and the other side, uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's 57849. You'll notice that both numbers allocated to both telephones are similar. In fact, the first three digits are exactly the same. The only two digits that differ are the ones that are being dealt by the final selector. And you'll notice that all of the numbers are different and this is by design how to make it work without having to modify the cradles where the step-by-step -step switches are placed. In a real telephone exchange, these separate switch banks won't actually be on the same rack. In fact, they might not even be in the same telephone exchange. For instance, this one would send it off to another town if it had to be. So apparently this is what this pertains to down here, Comp 1, which means Composite 1. And that's because it's a composite of multiple different systems. At this current moment in time, I am merely regurgitating information I have been told. I still don't fully understand the workings of 
this and I need to figure it out in case something breaks. So that is going to be my project over the next couple of weeks is literally getting to the bottom of everything in here. So this machine right here is basically a massive brushed motor that is actually connected to a bunch of cams on switches over at this end. And this thing is the ringer. Apparently in a telephone exchange there tends to be two of these. One that is used and one that is back up in case this one breaks. Let's turn it on. When you remove the dust cover you see that there is a cam that is turning on and off these switch contacts over here. And basically these switches are in charge of turning on and off the ringers, the dial tone, the busy tones and all that stuff in the whole of the exchange. So basically from above from the final selector for instance the telephones get told to listen to this thing and then this thing tells the telephones the ring. How cool is that? I'm going to explore this at a later date but as far as I understand there are a selection of oscillators inside this that actually get turned on and off with this which is uh, pretty cool. Above the ringer we have the line relays and ringer controls. These covers on top stop dust getting into the relays and switch contacts which is the number one problem apparently that these sort of things suffer from. So as far as I understand, these line relays are bespoke to this actual rack. So if I pick up a phone on this line, this group selector will start listening. After I've thoroughly gone through this machine, I'm going to do another video when I'm a little bit more clued up on what the fudge is going on here. But I've also uploaded on the Museum of Everything Else YouTube channel a video of Richard talking about all of these boxes in his own words. Next up we have these group selectors and a final selector. There's labels on the front to say where they're listening from and what they are. For instance, this first group selector is actually listening to the line relays below. Anyway, we'll lift these dust covers off for now and we'll have a look at it functioning without them. So the first thing I'm going to do is pick up the phone which turns on the line relays which sends it over to the first group selector. Ooh, now it's listening. Now when I type in five, this whole mechanism lifts up to the fifth level and then it hunts for a free line. Obviously in this one, it's not hunting for a free line. It's actually hunting for a designated line that Richard has specified around the back. So then it goes over to the second group selector here. So five. And then, and then we need to type in seven. Eight. And now we're over to the final selector. So the first number we type in is six. This one doesn't need to move along to hunt for a free line because, well, there's no selectors after this one. So after that, it flicks over to the second line. It listens to see whether it's free or busy or whatnot. And it calls the other phone. Richard's also installed a number of alarms on here. For instance, if a fuse goes, it'll do this. There's also an alarm for mechanical jams to stop electromagnets burning out. And you can see Richard talking about this over on the other video on the Museum of Everything Else YouTube channel. Also, there's a small control panel, including a switch where you can turn off the ringer motor because the brushes may wear out. And also inside here is a buzzer. <laughs> also, you can plug in an engineer's phone, which is also called a butt, and you can plug that in to test all of the dial tones coming from the ringer. Also a nice chunky power supply that sends the 50 volt DC over to the relays as well as 75 volts AC I think over to the ringer. I hope I'm right, please correct me if I'm wrong there. <laughs> so this has only been around for a day so I need to have a good look around it to you know get my head around it all. But I can't help but feel like I caught this in the nick of time because if I was a little bit late this might have already been taken apart and been sold as parts on eBay and that would have been, that would have been a sad time. So yeah, I'm really glad that Richard was more than happy to part with this as a complete item because it's fantastic and Richard's done an amazing job. Anyway, let's finish this video by making a few phone calls. 